In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. Indeed he is risen. Christos was Christ. My dear brothers and sisters, <clears throat> we hear in the Gospel of John the Theologian today the fourth sign of seven that he describes in his Gospel. It's a sign of healing, and it exemplifies the divine power of God to restore a person to wholeness and to wellness. Both physically and spiritually, the deacon read that this occurrence came at the time of an Old Testament feast. It was the Old Testament Feast of Pentecost, also known as the Feast of Weeks. And this feast commemorated the law being given to Moses by God on Mount Sinai. And it's significant that <coughs> this event <coughs> occurs at this time. And it occurred, according to the Gospel, each year. The law being given to Moses is what prepares the people of Israel for the coming of Christ in the Incarnation. The law is not salvation to them. It's a pathway of preparation salvation. It shows them where they are in the circumstances of life and what must be done and what needs to be corrected in order to receive Christ once he becomes incarnate. The place where this miracle occurs is called Bethesda. It's a place having five porticos five porches, and there were pools there that were fed from underground springs. This Bethesda is located in Jerusalem, very near the Sheep Gate. And that too is significant, because it is through that gate that the sheep that were going to be the sacrificial lambs came through that gate and they were washed and prepared for sacrifice in the temple. And the reason why that's so significant is this is the way in the temple Jews made atonement for their sins. Christ in the New Testament is also going to be the sacrificial lamb. But it's going to be much different from the sacrificial lambs of the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, they were multiple. There were many sacrifices of blood. But in the New Covenant, it's going to be one final sacrifice. One final blood sacrifice voluntarily by Christ for all people of all times before him while he was on earth and even us who come after him the pool serves as sort of a a type of baptism Christian baptism. Under the Old Covenant, it said in the Gospel that the people would gather together and they would wait for the stirring of the waters by an angel. And when the water was stirred, the first person to reach those waters and go into those waters, he was healed of whatever malady 
he or she suffered from. One person on one occasion. In the New Covenant, baptism is given to all people of all nations. And it's a direct participation in Christ's sacrifice, blood sacrifice of the cross. Christ brings us to wholeness directly. There's no mediator like in the, like in the Old Covenant. The angel is the mediator. The angel is coming and stirring the water. But in the New Covenant, Christ is with his people. Christ is with his creation. He becomes one of his creation for the sake of his creation. To restore them to wholeness, to restore them to fullness, to unite them again with his Father. And he does this by himself, not through the use of angels. He uses angels to make announcements. And angels glorify him always and continuously. Now there are some other significant features of this fourth sign in John's Gospel that we need to take a moment and look at. First we have to look at the paralytic, the one who suffered, the one who couldn't walk. Christ singles him out even before the angel comes and stirs the waters. Why does he do this? He does it because he wants to teach the people what is the fruit of perseverance. Here is a man who for 38 years came to this Bethesda. And he would be with all of the other people waiting for the stirring of the water. And when the water was stirred by the angel, he never made it. There was no one there to help him or assist him. It was almost an impossible task for this cripple to do. So Christ asks him, what is it? What do you want? That's significant. You see, we have to tell the Lord our needs. Yes, he's omniscient. He knows all things. But we have a need to express to God our needs. How we need help to keep the temptations of the evil one away from us. How we need help to overcome our physical maladies. How in unselfishness we ask him to help other people of their physical and spiritual there's a real need for us to do that. Because God will respond to that. But don't tempt him. Don't ask him for something soon. <clears throat> like, Lord, give me a Lamborghini. <laughs> don't, don't, don't tempt God that way. Or I need a third home because I have one where I work and I have one by a lake, but now I want one by the sea. Don't waste your time. You see, he points out that the need of this man, and he tells us that we have our needs that we need to come to him with. And have the same faith as this man, the same perseverance of this man. To ask him over and over and over again if need be. And never to give up. And then finally the fruit of God is there, the blessing of God is there, the grace of God is there, and he pours it out on us. And we're made well, we're made full. And at the same time, we need to learn from this particular sign that we need to help each other. 
when we see people that need help and assistance, we shouldn't be walking away from them. We shouldn't turn our heads in another direction. But we should go and help. And likewise, when we need that assistance, we hope and pray that there will be those that see us in our needs and come and help. Now you might ask, why on one of the possible Sundays are we talking about a paralytic? Because, dearly beloved, again I'm going to repeat, this miracle shows us the divine power of God to make us whole. Example, the Pharisees and the scribes, they saw the miracle. Because once the man told of his need, God just looked at him and says, pick up your bed and go home. So he picked up his bed and he started, he didn't go home. He went to the temple to give thanks to God for what had just occurred to him. And the scribes and Pharisees saw that. And they became critical of what Jesus did because they hated Jesus. I mean, we, we were at a point now, this was pure, unadulterated hate. So they criticized Jesus how he, 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 he defiled the Sabbath. Because if you pick up your bed and you carry your bed on the Sabbath, you've defiled the day. But what about the miracle that just occurred? What about the man who was paralyzed for 38 years and all of a sudden, in an instant, he's picking up his bed and he's walking and he's going to the temple to praise God. <clears throat> they didn't see that. They were blinded to that by their hatred, by their brutality. They're not governed by the spirit of God. They're governed by the spirit of this world. Overly critical. See, because not only did the scribes and Pharisees suffer this paralysis because of the spirit of the world, so did their forefathers. Christ sent prophets century after century to prepare the people for the incarnation, to show them the error of their ways, to call them to repentance. Not only did their forefathers not fear the prophets, they killed the prophets. Through the spirit of this world, they were all bound up in their power, in their authority, and they looked upon anyone as a threat that would in some way tell them they need to change. But what about us? Do we suffer paralysis? Yes, we do. Each and every one of us does. Each and every one of us needs to be made well by the grace of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't we all know that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit? We became the temple of the Holy Spirit in our baptism. Not by anything we did, but only by and through the grace of God. And that spirit lives and dwells in us. Dearly beloved, God lives and dwells in us. But we need to have the spirit of God function in us. We need to be influenced by the spirit of God and not the spirit of the world. <clears throat> Out of the spirit of God comes meekness, humility, and grace. Out of the spirit of this world 
comes the spirit of pride, the spirit of self-indulgence, the spirit of self-service, the spirit of materialism, and yes, even the spirit of brutality. So at times we're not much different from the scribes and Pharisees. But the only way we can become more like the apostles and the saints that have gone on before us is we have to. The Spirit of God is here. It's in within us. We need to have it work within us. We have to invite it to influence our lives and our decisions every day and every moment of every day. <clears throat> it is only in that way that we could rid ourselves of the spirit of this world that promises joy and fruitfulness but gives only bitterness and death. Therefore, dearly beloved, let us pray to God that this Holy Spirit that he's instilled within us, through his grace, we will allow that spirit to work within us and to influence, influence us so that we too become like the apostles and the saints. And that we may realize that when the spirit of God is working within us, we have within us the kingdom of God in all of its sweetness, in all of its goodness, in all of its light, in all of its meekness, and in all of its grace. O Holy Spirit, thou spirit of meekness and grace, come and abide in us as we pray. And to thee be glory and praise forever. Amen. Amen.